final introduction, I will turn things over to you, Courtney. Thank you so very much. So like, uh, like CJ said, my name's Courtney Lanham and I work for the Center for Excellence in Disabilities. And one of my specialties throughout my career has been focused on developmental intellectual disabilities. I have worked in the West Virginia waiver program as well as uh, I studied it and also I have worked the system from a direct care level all the way up to a behavior specialist and now as a trainer for programs such as that. So I've had a lot of experience in the IDD realm. So as we go through this, I'm going to give you some tips. This presentation is very content heavy. So what I want to do is I'm going to touch, I'm not going to touch on every single thing on every slide. But there are things I'm going to point out to you and I'm also going to make sure that you receive a copy of this training afterwards. So the Center for Excellence and Disabilities, if you're not sure who we are, we are part of West Virginia University as well as the Health Science Center. We're also part of a larger network called AUCD. And that larger network is great because I really strongly encourage you guys to get in touch with it. Get on the website and check it out. There's tons of webinars that go out. There's a lot of policy-based information. You can get involved in different special interest groups if you're interested in the field of disabilities. And it's just a really wonderful resource to have. So some of our roles at the center, of course, are training and education, such as we're providing to you. We also provide a lot of pre-service education to students technical support to our community and individuals with disabilities within it, filling in direct service gaps, dissemination, and one, one, one that we're really proud of recently because it, under our new, well, she's not new any longer, she's been here for at least four or five years now, four years, uh, our director, Dr. Leslie Cottrell, she has really pushed us in this research area and I am very proud of it. We serve the whole state of West Virginia the counties that you see in blue in the map are counties that uh, we have CED staff housed. So that's where their offices are. Our main office is in Morgantown, West Virginia, but we also have another main office in Big Chimney right outside of Charleston. In addition, the other staff are housed in DHHR offices around the state. So if someone needs services in a county in white, then all they would do is contact the program and someone in a blue county near them would provide those services. Some of our services also currently are being either provided through telehealth or we are starting to provide more in-person services like before, now that COVID's starting to, we're getting a little bit better understanding. But I will warn you guys, uh, as everyone else, things do change. And so the way we provide services change However, throughout everything with COVID, even when we were remote, we were doing a lot of things through telehealth. So we have seven programs, four clinics, which include our feeding and swallowing, a behavioral clinic, a next steps clinic, which helps individuals, particularly transition periods. And we also are really proud to say that we have a music therapy sessions too, which is great because there's not a lot of that in the state. We have approximately 90 staff members. That does not include our GAs or anyone like that. Those are just our basic staff members who of course are housed in the counties in blue. If you're interested in knowing more about us becoming an affiliate, just make sure you get on our website. Here's a link to directly get signed up for some listservs. So we often send out training information. We often send out news, we seek information from individuals or our partners. So definitely get involved if you're interested. So now that I went through my big spiel that I make everyone go through at the center, and so I have to do be a good role model and I have to go through it, we can actually get into the exact reason why we're here today, which is to talk about increasing awareness of developmental disabilities. So I am gonna tell you that I have no idea what level that you guys are coming to me at. So I'm gonna start with a lot of basics. I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about DSM and some diagnoses and things like that. And I may even give you some examples of some situations that I've encountered throughout my practice. So this statistic comes from 2018. I know that we are currently working on getting some additional statistics here on the state, but as you can see, we are above average in the number of adults that we have with some type of disability. 
I think that we know that as a community already. I think we're aware of that, but just to see how large we actually are above. And also West Virginia also re has the highest amount of children who receive IDEA services compared to the national average. So currently we're still setting at one in six children have a developmental disability. So the CDC kind of has a little bit of a broader definition of developmental disabilities that includes things such as ADHD and learning disabilities that whenever you begin to look at the breakdown of DSM and things like that, that's not always included. And even still a lot of times with like the school systems and things like that that they go with, those things aren't always included. West Virginia's IDD waiver, which I mentioned before, it defines developmental disability not uh, does not include those those disabilities. So it goes more from that explicit DSM axes and things like that. But what we're seeing is that since the late 90s, prevalence of things such as ADHD has jumped up significantly. So we don't know, it's kind of that, that whole argument of, do we know what we're looking at now or is it happening more? I'm from the, I'm from the school of thought that we just know what we're seeing. So I don't think rates of autism, I don't think rates of ADHD have increased. I think we just know what to look for and we know what to call it now versus calling it other things. But there are people who believe that there actually are rates that have increased. Those are all personal, you know, preferences. But from what I understand and from what I read, I lean on the side that we just actually know what we're looking at more. So whenever we're talking about developmental disabilities, they also, the CDC also states that they're twice as common in males as females. Also individuals who are, or children who are insured in Medicaid had nearly twofold the higher frequency than any other DD child or diagnosed ch child compared to those with private insurances. You know, we don't know exactly what that, what that reasoning is. You know, we can start to look at poverty. You can start to look at other aspects along those lines to state, you know, are there environmental aspects that could have contributed to these developmental disabilities or whatever it is, but we don't know what the correlation is. We just know that there is a correlation there. Also, this is a great app for you guys to, if you want to download it, it's a great milestone tracker app. I think it's pretty cool. I always tell new parents to download it, check it out because it really has a lot of early intervention teaching tools. It helps you not only identify where the child's at, but how can you begin to close that gap and what resources are there to begin to close it? And of course, I'm always going to plug West Virginia's birth to three whenever you begin to talk about young children. So whenever you talk about developmental disabilities, the biggest key to this is that they're manifested before the age of 22 years old. So this is actually where, you know, we start to look at things like guidelines that get put in and based on the stage. So when we look at modified diplomas and how children can can go beyond the age of 18 who have these disabilities and attend school, attend high school before transitioning. But that is based on the fact that we're defining it by 22 years old. It results in a, in a substantial function limitation in three or more of the major activities or life activities. I call them domains. So self-care, receptive and expressive language, learning, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living. These are the standards in which the IDD in West Virginia's waiver program based their eligibility and continuing eligibility as well as budgets. So those are important things to know. Now, I hope you guys are gonna join me, I believe it's next week for the person first language. It is one of my favorite trainings and I have some disability etiquette in there where I start to talk about things like assumptions around functioning. So if someone has a developmental disability, you know, by definition, they only have to have a limitation in three areas minimum. So someone may excel in one area, but not another. And so when you talk about, you know, access to things and how they're treated and, um, you know, assumptions, then we start to look at, you know, not assuming that everyone also has limitations in all of these areas, which some people do have more than three, of course, but not everyone. So DSM neurodevelopmental disorders. So this is kind of the umbrella diagnoses and we have intellectual disabilities, or communication, autism spectrum, which that's one that changed from the DSM-4 TR whenever DSM-5 opened up. 
So that encompasses things that used to previously be like Asperger's and things like that to where a more spectrum based. ADHD, certain learning disorders, motor disorders, including tick disorders and other neurodevelopmental. So what actually defines an intellectual disability? So let me see if I can open the chat. What do you guys think defines an intellectual disability? And it won't let me open it. Are you able to see that, uh, Courtney? I am not. It will not let me see the chat, unfortunately. Oh, oh and you're out. Are you out of full screen now? I'll, I can read those off as they come in. Okay, I'll stop sharing. So, cognitive functioning, okay. Uh, limitations as far as IQ or verbal um, functioning or understanding. Great, great. That's a good one. Any others? Okay, so what defines developmental disability? Is there a difference between the two? I'll pose that question to you. We have comprehension concerns posted in the chat. Okay, I, I, I was able to pull it back up now. Thank you. You know, Zoom glitches, it's all part of life now. So comprehensive, comprehensive concerns, that's a good one. Well, I teach developmental psychology, this is Kathy, and um, developmental, as far as I have been taught, is that they are not able to do the things that most children in their developmental stage or age range can do, and so it slows them down as far as their cognitive or um, emotional development, and intellectual disability is more as a result of some mental impairment which is created by either genetics or environment so i think they overlap but i think they're a little bit different um, sometimes okay good the good answer uh we have not meeting milestones and developmental concerns would include physical disabilities okay all right well so i think of it this way and i really love this picture because i i think that yes, they're different, but they're kind of the same. They're all the same, but they're, you know, one's different. So there are many different types of developmental disabilities. An intellectual disability is a type of developmental disability. Not all people with developmental disabilities have an intellectual disability. So think of it this way. All of your fingers are fingers, right? Including your thumb. But only your thumb is a thumb, right? They're not all your other fingers are different. So it's still a finger, but it's, it's a particular kind of finger, which is exactly what we're looking at here. So we have all kinds of different types of developmental disabilities, one of which being an intellectual. And I think people sometimes get those combined and sometimes they get them confused on which one's which. And, you know, you did a wonderful job. I think it was Kathy, right? You did a great job of saying, you know, we're looking at an, a cognitive impairment versus maybe developmental, uh, not meeting developmental milestones and things like that in other ways. But I just, I love this, this example because I think it really explicitly shows you how they're connected, but they're still slightly different and things. So misconceptions about these things, Victims and objects of pity. That's one that I've heard before, you know, burdens, unable to do things, having multiple disabilities. Oh, that's one. So we, we know about comorbidity, but we sometimes, or a lot of individuals will assume that just because someone has one diagnosis that they'll have multiple others, because of course that will affect other parts of them. That's not necessarily always the case. Childlike. That's another one that I hear a lot. And of course, the, their word special, and that's kind of ingrained in our community, but I think we need to start, stop leaning towards that because I would argue that everyone's special. I think everyone on this call is special in your own way. So by, by stating that, I don't think we're accurately even describing what we're trying to. But people are people and they all have different 
different things that, you know, bring, they bring to the table. And so we need to kind of take a step back and stop looking at intellectual and developmental disabilities as, as real flaws, but instead just different things. What is the most respectful term? Uh, what do you, what, in terms of what, what are you referring to Mary Ellen? I think, I think that, you know, using diagnoses, oh, not special. Uh, I think having a disability, having an intellectual developmental disability. So we'll talk a little bit about person first language uh, next week. And I really strongly, strongly encourage you to join me on that because I think it's important how we, we address individuals and we also need to acknowledge how they prefer to be addressed because some people may want to identify with their disability and some people may not. So, but it's still important, even as practitioners, that we acknowledge disabilities because, you know, those are important aspects of the individual. So we can talk a little bit about that next week, but definitely join me because that's one of my favorite trainings. Oh, sorry. So an intellectual disability is the most common developmental disability. So it is one of the ones that you're going to see the most often, and it can look so many different ways. The biggest thing is that it's manifested during the developmental period and we're seeing an IQ of 70 or below. It's also characterized by inadequate adaptive behavior. Now, everything I'm telling you is coming directly from the DSM. This is the biggest thing. So we're looking at inadapt inadequate adaptive behavior. We're looking at those domains and we're making sure that we're seeing deficits in them. So here's kind of that breakdown. So before the age of 18 with this, so of course, we're, you know, we have the age of 22 with intellectual or with developmental disabilities, but when you start to look at particular types of disabilities, then we start to have other age frames around them, such as autism. We have some age frames around that. This one, we have 18. I said below, uh, you know, an IQ of 70 or below, and also the collection of conceptual, social, and practical skills that are learned and performed by people in their everyday lives which is coming directly from those domains. DSM has included the IDD under the heading of neurodevelopmental disorder category. So that's the overarching category that these disabilities start to fall under. DSM-5 emphasizes the need to use both when diagnosing a clinical assessment and a standardized test of intelligence. So, so they're mirroring, mirroring that 70 and all of that. Now, it's important to remember that the severity of impairment based on that functioning test and then the IQ score allows more emphasis on actual functioning less than a number. So that's where I said before, we all need to acknowledge that IQ tests are really not always the most accurate form of measurement of someone's abilities because there are cultural assumptions within them there are things that people just do not ever get exposure to. So if someone is, is, is maybe eight years old and they've never been able to attend a mainstream classroom to begin to learn skills and learn their alphabet, then how are we to assume that they should have known this and how can we count it against them? They need to have at least been exposed to it and then tested on it. So that's where those adaptive functioning are extremely important because we acknowledge that sometimes these individuals just never get the opportunity for exposure. And also these individuals may have things around testing and reading that may distort those IQ questions. So everything, you know, of course, IQ is based on a bell curve. So we got, everyone knows this. We have those range between 85 and 115, which is considered, you know, the, the norm. Uh, you know, you can't see me put my air quotes up. I hate the word norm, but that's what we have to use in this term. And then we begin to look at those borderline functioning and we go down those standard deviations. So we see that most individuals fall around the 100 um, the hundred area. When you start to talk about degree IQ and degrees of intellectual impairment, which is broken down and it is uh, utilized in terms of approachment of treatment and all of that. And 
It's even utilized within the IDD West Virginia waiver program in terms of uh, services. We look at it, it breaks down this way. So a little over a 70 is, I, is, is considered borderline. And then we get into the, the 50 to 55 up to 70 is mild. And then 35 to 40 to 40, 50 to 55 is moderate. And then you start to get into the severe and profound. So we're, like I said before, you know, testing, it, it can really distort and vary even over time, particularly, it can vary for everyone, but particularly for this population, we're seeing it vary. So that's where we put a little less emphasis on these IQ scores as we used to, and we used to put more on, and we put more on those adaptive skills. So our IQ test, or our students IQ retested. Um, so, it, you know, it's probably done once, maybe a couple of times. It really depends. It depends on who's treating, what they're doing, why they're trying to do it, and all of that. Uh, we find that no one's IQ is really constant. If you were to take an IQ test uh, and you took it over, let's say, an eight, a, even a five-year period of time, if you took three of them over that period of time, you're going to find your scores varying because you've had different exposure to, you've learned new things, you, you know, we just find that those, those scores are never truly constant. Um, but, you know, you're, you're going to fall probably very close. You're going to be within a percentage or so of yourself, but it's not going to, it's still going to vary. Do all West Virginia students get a test? Um, I don't know that, to be honest with you. I'm trying to think back. I feel like, no, I feel like they, that, you know, the school system has their standardized testing in which they go off of. IQ testing really only gets implemented if there's a concern for a disability or a need or deficit of some kind. And I'll be honest with you, when even like looking at things come through now, people do not get new psychologicals all that often. Uh, some people do if it's like a high need to, if they're like, if there's a thing, a concern that maybe a diagnosis was wrong or something like that. But uh, other than that, they don't get a whole lot of updated ones too, too often. Unless they're getting, to, if they go to new practitioners, then they'll, they'll sometimes get new ones. But I'm still seeing the diagnosis of MR in people's um, charts, and that's been gone for many, many years now. Okay, great. So part of a psych ed evaluation. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not sure exactly what the school system's doing. I know that these things happen whenever there's a, I know for sure they happen whenever there's concern for or suspicion of. So this was used for uh, disabilities and gifted. Yeah, it, they may still be. I don't ever remember being IQ tested in, in the school setting. I was IQ tested in a different setting um, when diagnosed with ADHD and things like that as a child. Which even still, like taking that in consideration, uh, my IQ testing, if you would have diagnosed, or if you would have given it to me pre-diagnosis and pre-intervention versus post-intervention, that test score would probably vary substantially because of my attention span and things like that would be addressed. The biggest thing is uh, individuals with disabilities, in particular ID, they sometimes, it is, it's also called cognitive disabilities, they sometimes will take longer to learn things or do things such as speak, walk, personal care. So those different domains acquire tasks. It may, you, they may acquire accommodations and need things broken down for them. So that's a key part. It's not that they can't do things, that they can't learn to do things, but they're gonna probably take longer to do it and they're gonna probably need more interventions to assist them along the way. This is the biggest thing that I hope that everyone takes away from this, that I see even practitioners constantly kind of faulting on this area, and is that individuals with IDD tend to mature at the same rate as their, their peers of, I mean, I'm putting air quotes around neurotypical here still. So we're looking at cognitive level does not equal maturity and does not equal age. So I hear a lot of times like, I do a lot of relationship advocacy and sexuality trainings, and I'll hear people say, well, 
So this person's 40 years old, but cognitively or intellectually or developmentally, they're about seven. Yeah, but hormonally and, you know, age-wise, chronologically, they're 40. So you can't label them a seven. And also remember before, I said that they just have to meet this in three domains, right? And have that IQ. We're assuming that they're meeting, that they're having deficits in all of those. And that's not always the case. So the biggest thing that I always say is that we all have different areas to where we are more mature than others, where we are higher developed than others at certain ages in our life even. So there's, everyone has some variations. So by labeling someone by their you know, intellectual or developmental age, that's completely negating all those other areas that maybe they are excelling at and then the fact that they are of a certain age and then that starts to impede on human rights things as well over time. So just treat people their age and with respect. And I hate that I have to tell people that, but I see it happen all the time. So I always just have to say it. So here's some other common developmental disabilities. So we're looking at beyond intellectual, uh, intellectuals listed here, but here's some additional ones. So these are those other fingers that I'm talking about beyond the thumb. Autism, so autism spectrum, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, epilepsy, fetal alcohol syndrome. So autism spectrum disorder. I love this quote because first of all, I'm just gonna tell you guys, if you know Dr. Susanna Poe, she's a wonderful human being. I have the privilege of working with her at the center. She's also at the Neurodevelopmental Center in Morgantown. And she said one time, if you see one child with autism, you see one child with autism. And she told us that and it really stuck with me. Now, I don't know if she's the original quoter of this, if she, reinvented the will or if she really if this really just was where she came from and she's you know repeating it but it's always stood by me and I've always accredited her to it so it's very true and I'm just going to tell you this in all honesty if you see one person you've seen one person no matter what the disability is there yes we see commonalities but there's also so much variance within each disability and and then when you start to like put in comorbidity, it's so different. But in particular with autism, and this is why it's also so hard to diagnose, is because it varies so dramatically over individuals. So it's characterized by those varying degrees and by difficulties in social interaction, verbal and nonverbal communication, as well as repetitive behaviors. So the DSM-5 changed, I told you guys before, there used to be multiple diagnoses that encompassed kind of autism, but now we're looking, or there were separate ones, now we're looking at just one in this overarching spectrum. So when someone is receives a diagnosis, they're gonna receive it on a level of support basis. So one level requiring some supports, level two requiring substantial support, and level three requiring very substantial support. And we're looking at all three of those domains. So someone with like Asperger's that would have like before being diagnosed with that, more than likely, depending on their needs, they're gonna be diagnosed with a level one, maybe a level two, depending on some things. I've even seen people's like levels change. I don't know how I've seen that once. I don't know. It came into a clinic, into our clinic. I don't know how, um, how valid that is, but I have seen that before. So like I said before, these were what it used to look like. And this, that's kind of the new comparison. So if you've seen any of these, they're now kind of encompassed under this one umbrella term. Some common characteristics that we're seeing is repeat, repeating names, phrases, so that repetitive type, type thing, uh, scripting of things, repeating, touching, or checking of items, so those OCD type things. That's where we a lot of times we'll see people get misdiagnosed as OCD because they'll be exhibiting this behavior. Unusual attachments, items, paper pens, blankets, toys. I know a child who loves tissue paper, like we buy him Christmas gifts and presents all the time. He's a family friend and he would rather have the tissue paper. So we just buy him like extra things of it because he like strips it into ribbons and it's amazing actually what he does with it. Ritualized cleanliness and hygiene. Once again, that's where sometimes we'll see a misdiagnosis happening. Unable to read 
and react appropriately to emotional states. That's that social perception and picking up on it and unable to tolerate minimal changes. So that inflexibility. So some good strategies to help individuals with success are to follow daily schedules with a basic flow that you know, rarely changes unless it absolutely has to. Now I'm in the, I'm in the frame of thought that you know, life is not stagnant. It doesn't stay the same. So sometimes we need change so we can, you know, get used to it and be prepared for it. So I think sometimes throwing in those are good to help, uh, help people succeed. Prepare them for advance or in advance if you can, if there's changes, so prep them for them. Also, like I said before, prep them if there's unexpected things happening. So for instance, if you guys always take the same route home, if the road's closed, then you may have to take another route home. That may be a very simple thing for some people, but for other people, it may be a really big deal. Uh, teach, teaching methods. So also, you know, looking at functional communication to indicate desires and all of that. And the other thing here, removing fluorescent light when it's flickering and all of that, that's just one example of environmental things that you can do to make the environment a little bit more comfortable for the individuals because they may have high sensory issues. We know that there's no one cause, of course, there's a lot of speculation about what's causing it, but what we're finding is, is that there's really, there's really no general consensus. That really we are suggesting that it comes from a combination of genetic and non-genetic, also environmental influences as well. We know that it's happening at one out of 59 births, as well as males are four times more likely. This applies to college age and adult autism as well, correct? So yes, uh, yes, and it, what, so okay. So adult autism is not really a diagnosis in the DSM. Uh, what that is, is more than likely that person was wrongly diagnosed, more than likely under something like ADHD or OCD or something as a child and they found out later in life that indeed that diagnosis was wrong and they indeed do have autism instead. So but when you start to look at it autism really is something that should be diagnosed at a younger age. Yeah and sometimes you're right it's never diagnosed. Absolutely. So SPD, so we're looking at sensory perception disorders and things like that it is very common with individuals with autism. Now, not everyone has this, but sometimes they do. And we see often that it's either going to be a hyper or a hyposensitivity to touch, sound, smell, touch. So either they crave more sensory input or they are overwhelmed by sensory input and they need less. A gentle hug may be overwhelming for someone who is overwhelmed by sensory input, especially touch. Some people may be more sensitive to some than others. Uh, some people may just be sensitive to sound. It all varies. Some individuals may not be bothered at all by any of these things. Wearing clothes can sometimes be a torture for someone who is sensitive to touch because of tags. Uh, Honestly, I think it's great that I've noticed most clothing brands are going to a tagless away from those like stitched in tags, but instead printing it on. I think that's wonderful. I think that's actually uh, a more universal thing that they can do for individuals because even I hate tags. I always cut them out of my clothing because I just think they itch. It doesn't cause me severe discomfort, but it's still uncomfortable. Certain foods and textures may cause someone to gag and they may not be able to swallow it. So that's where knowing about things such as our feeding and swallowing clinic at our center, which does take individuals of all ages, is a great resource. Loud noises, of course, all of that. It may seem to need more sensations and may seek output. So they may, this is where people often are recommending like weighted blankets for people. So weighted blankets are not good for everyone. That's a common misconception that they're comforting for everyone. In fact, it's just those individuals who kind of need that extra, that uh, extra sensation. So it's those people who are kind of low, low sensory input and they need more of it. They may crave motion, rock back and forth. So that we see those repetitive type behaviors. We see spinning a lot. So kind of that 
um, getting the those sensations going and kind of our our uh, inner ears and things like that and may lose control in strange or sensory overwhelming situations It's important to remember that a meltdown is not the same as a temper tantrum. So there are often times that we see children with autism and even adults sometimes who are having major sensory and communication overloads and problems. And sometimes individuals will perceive that as having a temper tantrum. But in reality, this is just a way for them to communicate that they are in sensory overload right now, or you're not understanding them because they're communicating differently than you. And it's important that we take a step back and we really evaluate the environment, we check in with that person, and we don't assume that what's happening is a temper tantrum. And I think that's a good practice for a lot of children without disabilities, because a lot of times we think, oh, they're just doing this for, for this reason or something like that, when in reality, they may not, they may have a need that they just don't know how to communicate to you yet. So it's important to remember that individuals with autism diagnosis can contribute to society and can be, a, you know, are everyone's working peers and in fact that they are. So not everyone is, you know, uh, very sensitive or have these like very high intelligent levels that we do see variance in intellectual functioning. We, there is a very, whenever we say it's a very large spectrum, it, we really mean that it's a very large spectrum. So we're seeing people with sensory issues and without and I want to make sure that you guys know that you know based on the research that we have based on everything that we understand and the people that I talk to such as Dr. Poe it is not caused by vaccines what we're seeing instead is that you start to see the symptoms and those kind of um, cue points of autism around the same age just by coincidence that they begin to receive a lot of these other vaccines. And so people have made this correlation and thought that it was a causation. But in fact, we're just seeing it happens around the same age. It's just coincidental. And also there is some new research on gut brain biology, but I don't know a whole lot about it. And I don't know the validity of it. I don't think that we have enough research um, and long uh, longitudinal studies to really get a good idea. We don't, this is, we really just know what what we're looking at over the last like probably 20 years. Here's some great resources for autism, if you don't know. So check these out, uh, just jot them down. And I really, we work very close with Autism Training Center, so that's a great one. This is, I like this graphic, it's cool. So cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a term used to describe a group of chronic conditions affecting body movements and muscle coordination. So it is a muscular based thing. Failure for the brain to develop properly or some neurological damage during the child's developmental brain will cause this diagnosis, will cause this condition. So cerebral means to the brain, palsy means movement uh, or posture. It's characterized by might tight muscles and spasms. There are interventions. I know a lot of people who get Botox injections for these. It's incredibly painful, but it still, uh, it, it still has shown some benefits. Absolutely, the slide presentation with resources. After this training, I'm going to send CJ the, because I don't have access to all your emails, I'm going to send CJ the slides that I'm showing you right now, as well as a social work CEU certificate, which is good for two hours and two credits of social work CEUs. If you have a other CEU thing, you're more than welcome to try to present it to everyone or to your board and they may accept it, they may not, but the, we, were, we are a provider of social work CEU, so we, we're able to give this. Uh, disturbance in gait and mobility. So this is where we also see variants where some individuals are able to walk and move around and some individuals are not and must use uh, wheelchairs for movement. Impairment of sight, hearing, and speech. And this all really has to do a lot with those muscular based things. We do see, see a higher level of seizure disorders that go along with cerebral palsy, but again, not everyone has it, but we do really see more that, that do than don't. And so there is some individuals who have intellectual impairments, but that is not always the case. Once again, in fact, I actually know more individuals that have cerebral palsy that do not have intellectual impairment than I do individuals that 
do, but there it does happen. We do see a comorbidity there. And that's because of that neurological damage that happens. So I love this video. This guy's a comedian. I'm going to show you this video and you guys can check him out. Um, I think he says his name right now. I'm blanking on his name right now. There is another comedian out there. He's a little bit controversial in, in the disability community, but I think he's funny. Um, he's just controversial because he he really believes in this identity first and he does, he's not very politically correct all the time, but he's brutally honest about individuals without disabilities and how they treat individuals with them. And his name's Josh Blue. But this guy's different and I will show you this video and hopefully you can hear it. Hi, I'm Zach Anner and the Cerebral Palsy Foundation asked me to help them promote the show Speechless by giving a list of my top 10 things I wish people knew about CP. I don't really know if I can come up with a list of 10 things, but I'm going to try. Okay, number one, just because I'm in a wheelchair doesn't mean that you can pet me like a dog. I'm not a dog, and I know it seems nice and I'm at dog height, but that doesn't make me a dog. And just because I like to pee outside sometimes, that doesn't make me a dog. And just because I won the Westminster Dog Show last year doesn't mean, oh my God. Am I a dog? Number two, I think it's pronounced cerebral palsy. I don't know if cerebral is a word. Number three, it is hard for people with cerebral palsy to make lists with their fingers, so I'm gonna stop doing it. Number four, if you ask me what's wrong with my legs, the real answer to that is uh, nothing. I have brain damage, so that's a little bit more exciting. Cerebral palsy isn't like, oh, that means your legs don't work. Some people with cerebral palsy are walking around just fine. Number five, just because I have cerebral palsy doesn't mean I'm inherently inspiring. I'm inspiring because I'm an author, a YouTuber, and I have the biceps of a Greek god. Number six, even though I have cerebral palsy, I still consider myself incredibly lucky. I have a great career, I have wonderful friends, and uh, somehow I've managed to make a living while not getting up before noon most days. Number seven, just because your grandson has cerebral palsy doesn't mean I know him, Ethel. I mean, we're not in, we don't even live in the same state. Number eight, yes, I'm gonna need some help with some stuff sometimes, but just talk to me like I'm a normal 31-year-old guy who's spilled a carton of chocolate milk on himself. Number nine, you are welcome to pray for me if you want, but I feel like having cerebral palsy is part of the reason I'm supposed to be here and one of the tools that I can use to uh, help people uh, be a little bit more compassionate and open to people with differences. So uh, it's just, uh, I'm working with what I got there. And number 10, and most importantly, almost everything I've said is subjective. And you should just talk to more people with CP and see what they feel about it. Because I'm not a spokesman for all people with CP. People with CP are as diverse as all of humanity. So just go out there, have a conversation, and do what you can to educate yourself. So that's about as good a list as I can come up with on the fly. And I hope you learned something today or nothing. I, I don't really care. But remember to subscribe to the Cerebral Palsy Foundation and check out ABC Speechless premiering September 21st. I think it's at 8.30, but I don't, I don't know for sure. So I, I love that. He said a lot of really great things. And the biggest thing is, is to, he's not a spokesman for everyone. This is just his experience and his perceptions. And I think that's important for everyone is that we all just acknowledge that everyone goes through things differently and how they feel about it's going to be different. <clears throat> so ADHD. So it's a brain disorder marked by an ongoing pattern of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. So we see kind of three levels of it. So inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. There are some people who have one of these. There are some people who have both or all three of them, two of them. There are people who mix for them. We also see sometimes where there's an alternating thing between hyperactivity and kind of hypoactivity where you'll see people have like, I was I almost think of it as um, a, a surge of energy for a really long time and then they flatline for a brief period of time and then they surge up again. 
that does happen it's for over it's for some individuals it's normal enough for the, for some people to have some inattention and be unfocused and things like that but for individuals with adhd it's more severe and it's more often so it's a struggle to do anything and i tell people that i really i experience i'm very open about being someone with adhd who actually unfortunately had to live 15 of the years of their life before anyone figured it out but once they figured it out my whole quality of life changed my grades changed from a d to a's i was more active in sports i was interested in people before i didn't really have much interest beyond my own self and my own racing brain so uh it really is a great thing whenever individuals kind of get this help but there are some times where I experience things such as I call it severe boredom to where I, it's not that I, it's almost like I physically feel boredom. So I can't find anything to do that will satiate my attention span that will, you know, I'm interested in long enough to, you know, enjoy it or anything like that. So you just end up experiencing this extreme boredom, which sometimes will get misdiagnosed um, or kind of perceived as depression, which is not the case. It's just we we have all this energy and we but we don't have the attention span to focus on one thing long enough to even um, get anything from it. So no one really knows what causes it. Uh, I think it's I think it's there's definitely a genetic basis to it. My mother 100% has ADHD, but was never diagnosed. She just was a master at behavioral modification and she channeled it in ways that work for her. And for a long time, she, that's what she did with me uh, until it got to the point where, you know, we needed an intervention and all that was was some other help. There are some individuals that do get mixed diagnosed with bipolar that are really ADHD because they, we start to see that swinging of hyperactivity uh, to hypoactivity, and we misconceive that as manic, uh, which in some ways, I guess you can say it, it may be a little manic, but you're not seeing all the other things that go along with bipolar disorder. You're seeing, the ener you're seeing energy levels and fluctuations like that, but you're not seeing, uh, you're not seeing any of the other personality-based things or anything. So genetics is definitely true. Like I have these, I have nephews and 100% my youngest nephew is a clone carbon copy of me as a child and bless my sister for it. Uh, well, there's also higher uses of substances for that. Uh, and they even say even drug use during pregnancy. I don't know how really true that is. I added it because it is in a lot of research, but I think that we're grasping at some things of course, we're seeing larger uses of substance because these things are a lot of times trying to regulate the brain and they will change the chemistry of the brain, which allows um, people's attention spans to start to change and all of that. When you start to look at stimulant use, it, you, it looks, or it behaves completely different in an ADHD brain than what it does in a brain without ADHD. So to me, we, we have to acknowledge a chemical compound difference within the brains. And the same thing with alcohol use, it's all about a lot of people are constantly trying to just slow down their brains. Exposure to environmental toxins during pregnancy, I could maybe buy that. I grew up in south, southern West Virginia outside of Charleston near the DuPont plant. So I 100% can buy that that could be a cause. I don't think that it's an ex exclusively a cause, but I think that it could be a contributing factor and research is leaning towards that as well. And low birth weight as well as brain injuries. And you know, brain injuries, ADHD, I would argue that those are separate. I think that ADHD, you're looking at something that someone's born with. Brain injury, you're looking at something that is typically acquired. Now that doesn't mean that someone doesn't have brain injury such as what leads to cerebral palsy and things like that. Uh, either during birth or, or something like that that can cause this. But a lot of times what I see is someone gets an acquired brain injury and then smacked right alongside of it, they'll get ADHD diagnosis because obviously their attention span and cognitions have changed. And that's not always the case. That's really just you're seeing symptoms of the brain injury. 
And also the medications that you use to treat ADHD will sometimes be given to individuals with brain injuries. And like I said before, stimulants for someone with ADHD act differently than stimulants for someone without that, that chemical need. So you start to see um, an increase in, in very odd behaviors that are leaning more towards like um, a chemical dependency and more substance use of it, not an actual chemical need of it. So it'll actually act as an upper for those individuals rather than a regulator like it does for individuals with ADHD. Fetal alcohol syndrome. This is another one that sometimes gets smack dab with ADHD. Sometimes it'll get misdiagnosed. It's the one of the few diagnoses that actually have physical features that contribute to it that you can actually use in diagnosing. So we see small head, we see a low nasal bridge, we see these small, the, or these enlarged folds in the centers of the eyes, smaller eye openings. One of the telltale signs is the, the flat upper lip and a thin upper lip, and, the, and a thinner upper lip. But this flat part, it's very smooth right under the, the nose. Poor growth is a, is a typical symptom also that we see. Lots well, of the babies in the womb and even after birth, decreased muscle tone and poor coordination. Now, people may not have severe cases of this, so these things sometimes can go undiagnosed. Delayed developmental milestones and also a deficit in the hole uh, in the wall that separates the right and left chamber of the heart. So we're actually seeing some cardiac issues related to this as well. Like I said before, you know, if children, and this is kind of the thing with autism and other, in any kind of like intellectual developmental disabilities, is if there's early intervention, then we're seeing a higher level of success. So really tapping into birth to three and all those other resources that are out there are key. Neonatal substance abuse. Now, I will tell you that we do have a new program. It's new over the last year or so at our center, and it's called Project Impact that focuses on neonatal, neonatal substance use and uh, focusing on getting parents all the treatments and all the things that they need prior to the child being born, such as making sure that they get all the, uh, they're going to all their doctor's appointments and all of that without the fear of prosecution and things that a lot of people, that keep them from accessing those services. But we see growth problems, behavioral issues, cognitive executive functioning deficits, uh, poor language, and we also see that they're more predisposed to their own drug use over time, which we see that with a lot of substance abuse or a lot of substance um, use throughout most individuals is that there's a family history of some sort. Not always the case, but we do see higher levels of it. Spina bifida. That is one that literally means split spine. So that's exactly what it is. And it happens when the baby is in the womb and the spinal column does not close all the way. About eight babies born every day in the US have it. And there is no known cause of it. Well, there, there is some research leaning towards some folic acid exposure, but we're not 100% sure on it. We just know for sure that it's happening in the womb and the spinal column is not fusing all the way. Tourette's syndrome. So this is one that I think more and more people are getting aware of and I think that's a great thing. Ticks are involuntary repetitive movements and vocalizations. They are also the defining feature of Tourette's syndrome. One of the biggest things is, is that there's a childhood onset and there's a neurodevelopmental, there's a, disorder, oh, sorry, a con condition known collectively as tick disorders. So even if what we're seeing to where someone may be experiencing very high levels and they maybe didn't realize it later on, so we may have someone in their 20s that are experiencing symptoms of Tourette syndrome or tick disorders, what we're finding is, is that they probably somewhere along the lines had them in childhood as well. They just probably were written off as like attention seeking behaviors or something along those lines. But what we find is that there is always a childhood onset of it. So there's three different types of tick disorders. Tourette's is just one of those disorders and one of the more commonly known ones. 
but there is chronic tick disorder, which is motor and vocal type and provisional tick disorder. I don't go into too many depths about these. I just want you guys to be more aware of some of the disorders that fall underneath of these that people either don't know a whole lot about or there are higher prevalences of. And this is the ones I've talked about before do have higher prevalences. The one I'm talking to you about right now is one that is a more rare disorder. And that's why I wanted to include it because I didn't know about it and I had taken several courses in college. I, my focus in college originally was um, psychology and psychiatry and I took a shift and I ended up in uh, social work after my psychology degree and then I ended up in disabilities. But I did not get exposure to this disorder until I was working in the IDD waiver field as a behavioral therapist and I got a child or I got a, an adult with this. And what it is, is it is one that is often misdiagnosed and is often seen as autism or attributed to autism but it is actually a genetic based diagnosis. So what happens is, and where you're gonna see it is there's a mutation that happens on the X chromosome and it's on one of the end parts of the chromosome. And what happens is one of them becomes very fragile or it'll be missing or it'll be partial or something like that. And that's what's causing the, the symptoms that you're seeing, it's a genetic based thing. It, there's also some, some telltale signs such as larger ears, a larger forehead, and we do see a lot of times that there is intellectual disabilities that go along with it. But like I said, this one is commonly misdiagnosed as autism. So here's kind of the science behind it. You can see it, you can see some of the rates of it. Of course, uh, what you're gonna see here is, and I think this is kind of interesting because you know, at first glance, you would think that females would be more likely to have it because they have two X chromosomes, so that increases their chances. But what we're seeing is that males are more likely to have it. And what we think is, is because where they have only one X chromosome, there's nothing else compensating for that DNA. So all they have is that mutated chromosome. So, and also, you know, it depending on where, where they get it from, they only get, uh, they only get, they may get it from their parents. So we do see that more than likely there is some family history of it as well. Not always, but there typically is. So Down syndrome, this is one that a lot of people, I think this is one that most people know about. And it is a presence of the extra 21st chromosome. And it occurs in one in every 750 births in the US. So of course, age risk or age factor of the mother is one of the higher indicators of Down syndrome. And that's just because they find that uh, you know, as you age, your DNA not, is not as strong and it does not replicate as accurately as it used to. There's an association of mild to moderate intellectual disability. And there's also some facial features and other physical things that attribute to this. So this is one of those other ones where we do see some physical features, but not all intellectual developmental disabilities have physical features that go along with them. Well, this is another one that we also see some heart defects and abnormalities that happen. Now it's important to note that individuals with Down syndrome are also at higher risk of other diseases and other future problems, as you can see here. So can a brain injury be considered a developmental disability? So we have, a, we have two traumatic brain injury programs at the center. Actually, we have a state and a federal program, state and federal programs. And there's also a TBI waiver program in the state of West Virginia. And I wanna give props to that program because I'm working with some people on that to begin to develop person-centered planning and dignity of care, which is really great. It's a really step forward. So props to that group. But one of the big things is, is the answer to this question is yes, if it's manifested before the age of 22 with significant adaptive functioning limitations. So that's where that age 22 kind of comes back. So remember we said developmental disability, there's a 20, an age 22 cutoff but then there's other disabilities that fall underneath of it that have other things. Well, this is where brain injury kind of can be considered it if it happens before that age. 
So birth all the way up to that, or even pre-birth. Here's some other kind of less, less known, less common developmental disabilities out there. I have uh, encountered a couple of cases of each one of these. So they're not too, too uncommon, but uh, they are a little less common than some of the ones that I showed you before. So what is a coexisting disorder? Well, I think a lot of you probably already know this, but a coexisting disorder is when you have two, when you have both someone that has an intellectual dis and a developmental disability and they have a mental health issue. So they may have uh, two things that are happening simultaneously. Now we hear dual diagnosis a lot. Well, that's just another term to use that to describe that coexistence of symptoms of both intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health. Another co-occurring disorder is substance abuse and intellectual disabilities or mental health. Now, a lot of people do not wanna, well, I think that we're getting better at talking about it, but I don't think there's enough talk about the, the crossover of substance use and individuals with disabilities but we are really starting to talk more about substance abuse and mental health issues, which is wonderful. So you're gonna hear coexisting disorders and you're gonna hear dual diagnosis. So getting back to this, I, I wanna get back to this actually and touch on this for one second. This is very important because <clears throat> it's important that we acknowledge that there is a dual diagnosis here and that this does happen because there's implications for this. So when deinstitutionalization happened, anyone that had an intellectual developmental disability were deemed to not be it, it, to not be adequate to put them in institutionalized settings. So that means if someone has a dual diagnosis of an IDD and mental health, that IDD will sometimes impede the treatment of their mental health care. So I've seen cases where people really should be in such as Weston Hospital, Sharp Hospital, but because they, based on their mental health needs, but because of their IDD diagnosis, Sharp Hospital has limitations of what they can provide to them because that environment's not deemed nurturing enough and okay enough for an individual with developmental disabilities, which I also agree with. So what we need to do is we need to create a space to where we're addressing someone's needs from a holistic standpoint and we're acknowledging that you cannot separate the fact that they have a mental health issue and the fact that they have an intellectual developmental disability. And we need practitioners who are more competent in providing counseling to individuals who have intellectual disabilities because that's where we can start to um, address these issues at the forefront before they get to the point where they do need to be in an institution-based setting. So I will tell you that West Virginia feels very strong about uh, individuals about with IDD not being in institutions. So co some common experiences that individuals with developmental disabilities are more likely to experience are trauma, abandonment, bullying, bullying, discrimination, and also a lack of fulfilling relationships. And I think this is incredibly important to acknowledge, especially when we start to talk about trauma. Trauma is one that these individuals may need more specialized care to overcome their traumatic experiences. We find that studies show that anywhere between 30 to 50% of individuals with an ID diagnosis experience some type of mental illness. So that's where we're going back to that, that dual diagnosis, that comorbidity. And we're seeing to where, you know, you can't separate these two and we need to make sure that you're providing adequate treatment. And some of that mental health issue comes back from these, these experiences that they're, that they're getting. And I will tell you that, yes, the ACEs is used for this population. And I think it's a wonderful resource to use because it does acknowledge kind of both of these sides of it for them. Some other common experiences for people with developmental disabilities, we do see a lower life expectancy in terms of years. Uh, it's well below average. 
there's emphasis on deficit and rejection. So when we're talking about individuals with disabilities, especially developmental disabilities, a lot of times treatment and everything is all about deficits. And that's where I come from a positive behavior, behavior support standpoint, where I'm gonna tell you that if you ever wanna address someone's deficits, the most direct way of doing that is acknowledging and utilizing their strengths. It's also one way to get people's buy-in. Strengths and interest are the two ways to get buy-in for change and also the two ways to, to really tap into uh, addressing deficits in a, without reinventing the wheel. Loss of control over life and limited choices, that happens all the time, even after adults in terms of relationships, all of those things. Individuals are frequently limited in what they have exposure to and what, um, what they can do. Now, for a long time, there was this whole thing about encouraging guardianship over individuals with developmental disabilities, and that was kind of the golden standard. We're moving away from that. Uh, when guardianship is sought, it should be sought on a preliminary basis with a plan of education and transitioning over and ensuring that that person's getting the skills they need to make those decisions. Uh, so that's kind of where we're looking at now, so more of that supported decision making versus uh, full guardianship. And what the problem with that is, is that full guardianship allows that person who is deemed their guardian make a lot of decisions on their behalf that are not always in uh, in the individual's best interest or the individual even agrees with. So we're seeing low social status and voluntary poverty and that's sometimes fueled through the system of making, you know, there's caps on how much uh, assets an individual can receive to remain on services and all of that. But we've made great strides with things like West Virginia ABLE that's helped us to overcome those things. And the other thing is lack of experience, not allowed to take risks. We do that all the time because we want to protect individuals. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, I didn't learn by what my mother told me. I learned by what I did more so. And it was, it, I did learn by watching other people's mistakes, but I didn't always learn just because someone told me that it wasn't good for me. Like I had to experience that on my own. And individuals with disabilities, not just developmental, but all disabilities should have the right to do that. Now, at the same time, of course, we need to keep safety in mind, but we can be proactive about that without limiting them so much. Uh, and we can change this with more normal, or normalization and inclusion. So like I said, just approaching individuals with disabilities as just people and seeing them as having rights and seeing the, them as having ability to achieve things and acknowledging that you, they just may need assistance along the way. So we talked about trauma rates a little bit, but we are seeing a huge discrepancy here uh, when it's in trauma rates and IDD. So children with IDD are three to four times more likely to experience some type of, type of maltreatment. And we also see the statistic of individuals with ID are four to 10 times more likely to be victims of crime than others without disabilities. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is, is that these numbers are probably very under because there may be individuals with, dis with ID, intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities that may not be able to communicate their trauma or their maltreatment. So those cases kind of go underway. So we always, when we see any numbers when it comes to such as rape or trauma or anything like that, we always assume that these are probably very underrated because either A, the person doesn't have the communication means to, or they don't have, no one's given them the voice to communicate it. And here's some of these the reasons why it makes them more vulnerable. You know, they are at a higher risk of abuse, especially sexual abuse, because they lack the words sometimes, not all the times to report what happens to them. We do not do a good enough job. And I'm kind of, I was told recently that I'm owed in the state for this, but we do not do a good enough job educating people on what their body parts are called, more or less what happens if someone violates those body parts. We use words such as kitty and, and bird and things like that instead of using penis and vagina because we don't feel comfortable doing it. I'm known in the state for making people stand in a room full of 100 people and repeat all of those words out loud together because we need to get over it as a society because what we're doing is we're putting people including children without disabilities at risk of being violated, or 
we're putting them at risk of them reporting it and because the language they use the perpetrator can get away with it because they didn't use correct terminology which 100 percent happens they do not we do not do a good enough job providing individuals with disabilities of any kind particularly developmental disabilities good abuse prevention training we do not provide them good sexual health education you know even knowing about their own body parts and all of that the, so taking the away from like sexual relationships but even just sexual or just reproductive health we don't do a good enough job about that and a lot of times their privacy is not respected you know, sometimes they may, and that's kind of tough because they may need physical help with certain tasks. So they may need help bathing or personal, a different personal hygiene. So there's a kind of a blurred line there and that puts them at a more vulnerable state because their caregiver may be someone's hired for them who has to perform an intimate uh, cleansing task. And then that puts them in a position where they can be violated versus if that person didn't need that cleansing task, they could do it on their own, then they wouldn't be in that vulnerable position. And I will tell you that we really, as much as we try, and I think that in good effort people try, we do not do a good enough job screening and following through with uh, individuals who are hired to work with populations like this. And we have several cases that have happened in the state of West Virginia. I'm not gonna put them on blast here, but uh, we've had it happen. And I, I know firsthand that the abuse went underway for a long time because of failure to really do good background checks and such. So challenges that individuals with RIDD often face. Well, of course, we talked about increased abuse and neglect, but also lack of services and support. Uh, and what I mean by support is lack of natural supports. A lot of times we see a lot of paid supports and we see very little uh, people that are in these individuals' lives not as much as children, but as adults. So as children, we see a lot more supports and family being there, but as, you know, of course, people age, parents pass away, they may not have other siblings or their siblings may not be in touch. We see a lot of those supports transitioning over to what I call kind of superficial and paid supports. We see a lot of non-accommodations uh, non and ADA compliance, just even in the community in terms of I, uh, you can go into downtown Morgantown and if you want to go into some of those restaurants or bars and you're in a wheelchair, you're not going to be able to get into them because there's steps to get into them. And that is a physical barrier that we have put into place that there is non-compliance and that it's excluding that person from that establishment. Being talked to and treated like a child, we talked about that, that's very common. And communication barriers, that is another one that sometimes happens. What I mean by communication barriers is verbal language limitations. You know, we all kind of uh, assume that there's only one way to communicate and that's through opening your mouth and talking, but we have found, and even through COVID, we have found that there's multiple means of communication. But what happens is if you rely so much on verbal communication and you meet someone who doesn't have verbal communication or they're limited there, then it really creates a barrier between working with that person. So make sure that you know how that, that person communicates. You let them know that you're able to make uh, any accommodations, whether that be a, a sign language interpreter. Uh, keep in mind that not everybody knows ALS or ASL, and even still there are modified signs out there. So working with people who are their caregivers, who are close with them to understand it, so you can talk to the person uh, and you don't have to talk to them through someone else. Receptive expressive language skills, that's another one. So if they're not big on uh, picking up emotions and all of that, that can definitely create a barrier. Communicating through a behavior, you know, I, I said that before, you know, a lot of times things are attributed to being annoying or attention seeking. And I feel like that's like, that does happen, but a lot of times that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times they're trying to communicate something further. And a use, lack of use of assistive technology. You know, assistive technology is incredibly expensive. So we, there are so many different things out there such as uh, PEX boards, there's iPads with different programs on them that can help individuals with communication, but they're really expensive. Now, I will tell you guys that we do have an assistive technology program at our center. It's called West Virginia, it's called WIVATS, West Virginia Assistive, assistive Technology Services. 
you can get on our website and find it. We have a lending loan library that we have tons of assistive technology devices in, including communication devices that people can try out to see if they'll work for them before they invest in them. And that's important because if you get one on an iPad, you have to buy an iPad and then the program can be $150 and then that person may not respond to that program and then you're out $150 or the insurance paid for that and they're not gonna pay for another one. So nonverbal communication, there's other ways that you can communicate beyond that, even without a, a iPad or whatever, but closed ended questions are great, not leading things in, yes or no approximations, being more broad or taking broad to more like detailed. So instead of saying, where do you want to go eat? Like you'll give choices and help using pictures, uh, you know, picture representation, uh, PEX type systems. PEX is actually a trademark system. It's kind of generally used as a picture as a kind of slang for a picture communication system, but uh, in fact, it's actually a trademark. So there's a lot of different kinds of those picture systems. So if you could say, are you hungry? Do you want to go to home to eat? Fridge or cupboard? Uh, soup or sandwich? So those are ways that you can start to narrow things down to give people choices and they can communicate their desires to you. Here's also another way that you can do it. Uh, you, can, you can draw this out, you can put it on a computer, an iPad, all this stuff, what do you want to eat? And then they just move through it and you give them choices. I like to, not, I like to give two choices, I don't like to give two more. Uh, sometimes if, if I know that they really like like four things, so let's say I know they like tacos, I know they like Italian, I know they like Chinese, I'll still give them two and I'll say, well, Italian and tacos. And like they'll pick Italian, I'll say, okay, Italian and, and Chinese and they'll pick Italian. Okay, well, I, now I know they want Italian because they told me twice. Now, they might get annoyed with you because maybe they really already told you they wanted Italian, but at least that way you're not assuming and they also know that they have more options than just the two that you gave them. It's really important, I've said this before, know that behavior is a form of communication. All behavior communicates some need. So do we need to express ourselves? Are we requesting an item or an activity? Do we need attention or something? And just because we need attention, that's not a bad thing. You know, people need attention and attention is a good thing. Uh, do we need to escape a certain situation? So do we need to, are we on a sensory overload and we need to get out of it uh, or something like that? Here's some forms of functional communication. So we have assistive technology devices. I told you that we have a lot of those for rent. AL, or ASL, picture exchange system. So that's that PEX. I guess that's a lot of people will sometimes use that as a generic term, but it is its particular type. Communication boards, picture boards and gestures such as pointing. So some basic tips for working with individuals with disabilities, be as concrete as you possibly can. Also, take a, break tasks into smaller steps. And if a person completes one and needs to take a break, then that's okay too. But just make sure that you're giving them the time and you're breaking it down for them. Make sure also that tasks are meaningful for them. So what I mean by this is we will see individuals be given a task and if they don't see the meaning in it and they don't care about it, then they're not gonna wanna do it, but then sometimes we'll get upset. So for instance, I knew of someone who got into a day program and they were assigned to sort beads. Well, every day they would flip the beads over, they wouldn't sort them, maybe they would do two or three, but they just wouldn't do anything. And it always got attributed to they were trying to, you know, just get attention or whatever it was, get their way, all of that. And what we found was is that the person just really did not see any need to short sort the beads. No one explained it to them. It was boring and all of that. But uh, what we found was if we began to give purpose to that task, then they were able to see why they were doing it. And CJ, you brought up a good point. That's not always easy in a classroom environment with all or any students. You're right. What I task you to say is you, you, can't, you can't always uh, individualize every task, but you can at least work with that person to see like, well, what is it that they, what is it about this task that isn't working with them? Maybe it's the fact that, maybe it's not even the task. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe the lights are too bright. 
So it's a matter of working with that person, observing them, getting someone a skilled behaviorist in there to help as well. And also if you can provide tasks or maybe an activity and provide it um, in a way that can be done in multiple forms. So not just in yes or no format of a test, but also open-ended questions. A lot of times that, that simple manipulation, that simple change will help. Uh, my spouse works at a hair school in Pittsburgh for Paul Mitchell and recently got a student who no matter what, like she knew that that, that student knew what she was doing, but every single time she go to, went to take the test and label the parts of the, the mannequin and all of that, uh, she just couldn't do it. So my spouse instead got a physical mannequin out, gave sticky notes with the labels on them, and the task was to physically stick them on there. And that's how that student completed that exam, that portion of the exam, because she was just having difficulty with that spatial awareness of that 2D piece of paper. So that's just one simple accommodation that can be made. Another thing is, you know, demonstrate what you need rather than give verbal instruction. So if you can show someone how to do it, then that's another way of meeting someone's learning needs. So this isn't even just for people with developmental intellectual disabilities. We all learn differently. We've all like instructions. I cannot, if you hand me a set of instructions to put something together, I cannot put it together. Now, if someone reads me the instructions out loud, then I can do it. <laughs> but I get overwhelmed by all the things on the piece of paper. If you were to give me the instructions, one, one, it broken down on several pieces of paper, then I can probably do it, right? But it's that, it, just acknowledging that all that stuff on one piece of paper, especially if it comes from Ikea and it's all pictures, is incredibly overwhelming and I'm going to start to shut down. So another thing to remember is to be patient with people and to value like if they're able to complete one small step to put that shelf together then high five you deserve a break uh you've really you've done it because like i said if there's a whole lot of components it's not to task the task itself necessarily that the person's uh intimidated by it may just be all the components that are going into it so for instance if you hand me a book if you hand me two books you hand me a, a a book that is 50 pages versus a novel that's 300 pages. I can read that novel perfectly fine, right? I have a master's degree, I can read that. But the sheer size of looking at the size of that book will overwhelm me because there's so much into it versus that smaller one doesn't overwhelm me so much. So it's easier for me to chunk things down into smaller portions because I can just handle them better because I don't get overwhelmed. So being patient with people and being willing to help them and work with them is incredibly important. Provide longer breaks or more breaks. Like I said, accessible formats give immediate feedback. So if I do something wrong, then it's important to kind of correct me on the spot because then I can learn better from that. I can apply it better versus me thinking back to say, okay, well, what was it that I was doing? How did I do it wrong? Because remember for someone like me, I may have a million things going on in my brain. So it's hard for me to get back to that fine detail of things. So you might want to just give it to me right then. And also another one is, you know, new information should be, if you can, it, you know, accompany it with any kind of visual cues and pictures. So giving that alternative two things is incredibly useful. Use observation skills and alternative forms of communication if possible. So if someone has a hard time verbally communicating with you, then shift to email communication, written communication, and vice versa. If someone's having a hard time with uh, communicating through email to you because maybe they're perceiving your instructions or maybe they're perceiving your feedback as though that they were completely wrong or you're mad at them because they're just having a hard time picking up on perceptions there, then go to do video chats with them so they can see your face, so they can hear your voice, the tone of your voice, so it can all get put together. Those are all, all good things to think about for individuals. And uh, also body language and tone of voice may say more than words. So, you know, if someone is not, is not able to pick up on what you're saying or they're gonna, re they're gonna default back to your body language and vice versa. 
if someone doesn't really pick, if someone's maybe on, uh, has some of those social deficits and that receptive issue, and they are on the autism spectrum, they may not pay any attention to your body language or tone of voice. They may be explicitly listening to the words that you're saying in a very literal way. So you need to be cautious even about that in terms of using slang words or using things that are expressions that we commonly use because they may, like it's raining do cats and dogs outside. They may take that very literal. And that's important to know about someone. I love this slide and this is the, this is my ending slide. And I think it's, I think it's incredibly important, but people with developmental disabilities or any disability for that matter are valuable contributing members of society and should be created equally and with respect. And I'm gonna go ahead and say something else in regards to this, that if you attend some sessions later on, you'll probably hear me say again, but we need to stop thinking that the word disability is also a bad thing. The word disability is not a bad thing. It is a part of human nature. It's a variance of humans, just like eye color, hair color, skin tone, all of that. It's just a variance of humans. And there's nothing wrong with having a disability. What's wrong with it is that no one makes the accommodations and no one stops to try to help people overcome whatever it is they're struggling with. So even things, and I'm gonna put this in the chat, even things like this, or saying words such as differently abled, those are things that people with, without disabilities more than likely created. I'm telling you from the field of disabilities that people with disabilities for the most part are proud and we need to say the word. So that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I want to open it up for, before we fill out the training evaluation and all of that, I wanna open it up for questions, comments. We have like 20 minutes or so for that. So I am here for, to answer anything for you. Hopefully I can answer it. If not, hopefully I can get you a resource for it. Hello, um, I had a question. At a college level, if you have a student who you're working with, and you realize there is some special need there, you can't pinpoint it. Um, what steps would you take uh, to uh, respect their privacy, but still be able to help them in the best way you could? Absolutely, so one thing that I would do is, is you know, you're acknowledging that this could be a barrier for their education, possibly, and you don't want them to fall behind. So, you're also acknowledging that there's probably things that you can do, but you just may not know what to do to help them. So I would always say that to reach out to your disability office, every university should have a disability office there that helps uh, uh, navigate accommodations. Now, I will tell you that that office may not acknowledge and cover every single student, or they may make that student go through hoops and jumps to get accommodations. And that's an issue. So for me, like I, I just had my ADHD, I just needed to be able to take math tests and standardized tests and things like that in a more private, quiet place because for standardized tests, if I saw everyone getting up and turning in their test or flipping it over and I'm not all the way through it, then I get hyper-focused on that and I get distracted and I start to get anxiety because I'm like, well, why are they finished? And I'm not, and then I can't focus. So, but whenever I tried to go to the Office of Accommodations at WVU, they wanted me to go through retesting for my ADHD, which my psychiatrist who had treated me as a child said, I'm giving you this diagnosis, this is what it is. So that was a barrier and my insurance wouldn't pay for that retesting because I just had it from a psychiatrist a couple of years before and I had received a 504 from throughout my high school. But uh, so what I did was because that office didn't cover me, I went to every professor and just kind of worked with them to let them know. And that, you know, it, I was very lucky because I, were, I was in social service, you know, disciplines. So they were able to take those extra steps. So if you don't have a disability office, which I think every, every university has at least someone designated to be that person, if, even if they don't have an office, I think there's a person. Uh, I don't know how it works at, at the level of university that you guys are. 
but you know, what I would recommend on a personal level is to recommend them to that person or that office and then just sit down with them and say, hey, I, just like you would with any student, I see you're struggling. It doesn't matter to me the, the reason why you're struggling, the diagnosis. It matters to me that you're struggling. How, what are you struggling with and how can I help you? How can I do it differently? What are some things that we need? Now, they may say, I don't know. So that may be your thing. Well, okay, well, let me be creative and let's try some different things. So give them the material in a different format. Maybe if they're having a hard time testing, do oral exams. I've, had, I've been given oral exams before and they make a world of difference because like I said, seeing all those questions on one piece of paper or on a computer screen, testing on a computer is difficult for me. But seeing that on one piece of paper, it's not the question that's overwhelming. I can answer the question but I can't even get to the question because I'm so hung up on the fact there's so many of them. So can you provide them maybe two questions per piece of paper or something like that, if that's what that person's having issues with. So things like that. But I really recommend it finding out who you're, if you have an office at your university or at least who is the person that's in charge of that. I have a comment to make on that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, CJ, I have a comment on that. I was just chiming in, that's us, Courtney. <laughs> okay, well, great. <laughs> That's you see I, and I don't know like I said I work for a very large university we have a very large office that we work with we more work with community members with disabilities they more work with the students we do have some overlap on that um, in particular we have a program called country roads that we just started to where we have five cohorts who are individuals with intellectual disabilities who are now starting to enroll into college at the university and are going through curriculums. There's some uh, like it at Clemson University and our end goal is that they will exit after us with new life skills training as well as a degree of their choice. But yeah, so you guys are the office. So just reach out to them and they'll help you navigate that. And, you know, I, I love to brainstorm. So even if you just want to kind of, uh, you know, bounce anything off of me or like anybody in your office needs help just always call me because what I find is that I have to bounce things off of people because I don't have the answer for everything and I don't and everyone's so different and and that's the biggest thing but uh, if you can find an interest that someone has and try to tap try to tie that interest to your discipline or to whatever you're teaching them that helps I think sometimes because that in, at least increases interest level. I, I have a, a, a question. Um, something that I struggle with, um, I think it's great all of the things that we're able to do at West Virginia Northern to help our students get through um, curriculums, whatever it may be. But one of the things I struggle with is what happens to those individuals when they go out into the working world? Um, you know, I know that there's needs for accommodation in workplaces and things like that. But sometimes it worries me if we're doing too much and then they get out into what I will say, for lack of a better term, the real world. And then what do they do if they don't have the same type of accommodation? It only worries me. Yeah. And, you know, that is a fine balance. And there are, there are uh, things out there such as DHHR, uh, you know, the Voc Rehab that they kind of help with that, some of that transition. And I think that you hit it dead on is that we, we should be doing this for all students. How do I prepare them to succeed in the future? And part of it with some individuals with disabilities is you're taking more steps to prepare them. So while you're helping them meet this need, you should also empowering them to advocate for themselves, to identify how they can meet their own needs sometimes, how they can break tasks down. So like you said, like you're seeing where uh, it's broken, you can break tasks down. So a test, you can break it down in Blackboard. Well, if my job, if my boss sends me a task, then maybe I know that I can, if I'm looking at the whole list, that's intimidating, but I can put sticky notes and I can put all, multiple things out. So I'm only having to look at one thing at a time. So you can teach them things like this. And also know the resources that West Virginia has out there. Like, Voc Rehab and HR, uh, I always get this, HRDDF, I think. I think that's the acronym for it. But there are entities out there that do help with that transition from post-secondary into um, the workforce field. Thank you. 
Hey, I have one question also. This is Kathy. Um, in the past, I thought I was given the impression that you should not really make accommodations for students unless you have some sort of documentation from the disabilities office. I mean, I have helped students in the past, but I've sometimes had some come to me and say, well, I had an IEP in high school and I always had accommodations and I need you to do this and this and this. And I say, I'm happy to do that, but I really need you to go through the disabilities office to verify and then they will send me a list of what accommodations you need. And I have some people who don't seem to want to do that. So I'm always afraid if I'm on um, shaky ground, if I go ahead and do whatever accommodations they have asked me for without having any institutional or administrative support for me doing that. So I don't know, CJ, maybe you can answer that question. Well, I, <clears throat> I will say this and Courtney, please, Feel free to chime in um, in terms of making accommodation. Uh, I think that's pretty standard in terms of students who are working through a disability or accessibility office providing that form of documentation, although Courtney's experience um, sounds a little foreign in terms of them, you know, not wanting to accept the documentation that, that she was offering. Um, but I will say, I think it speaks a lot to just the idea of universal design. So it's, it's less about what exactly I'm doing for this student, but let me look at the instruction in general and the way the material is being provided and how can, how can I work to make that accessible for all students. Um, and so you're going to pick up with a lot of those adjustments, you might pick up some of the students who have the particular difficulties, um, you know, in, in, in doing the things that Courtney's suggesting in terms of making sure that we're speaking to all of the different modalities and looking for different ways for students to demonstrate learning and that they've met outcomes and objectives, um, rather than being nearly focused on one way of assessing or, or one way of doing something. So, so I think that idea of universal design and, and working with all students to, to look at, okay, how, how do you learn? And what are the best ways that we can make sure that there are opportunities for you to demonstrate your learning, um, you know, in, in multiple formats and modalities. Um, so Courtney, if, if you, if there's something else that I've missed there, feel free. No, absolutely. And like I said, you know, I, I experienced that firsthand. I know other students who have experienced these types of things where, you know, mine was they didn't want to accept that. But then there were other ones of like, um, you know, just different experiences they have. And I want to remind you that those are the people that are going to that office that are okay to go to that office that are accepting that they have a disability of some sort. Now, keep in mind that there are some people that they do not want to have that label because that could, that follows them for the rest of their life, first of all. And there's implications of having that that could interfere with things or whatever it is. You know, there are people who have strong feelings about, you know, that label. So, and then there's those people who they really need accommodations, but they've gone under the gaps and they haven't been diagnosed. So where does that leave them whenever they go to the disability office? So there are those things. So that's where, and then there's those people who are right on that brain. You know, I talked about all these like guidelines to these diagnoses. Well, what if they're at 72 IQ? They're not meeting that diagnosis, right? But they still have deficits. They still have needs. But that office, but your office isn't obligated. They may, you guys may still provide services to them. I hope so, fingers crossed. Uh, but you're not obligated to because they don't have that diagnosis because they don't necessarily meet those needs. But and they have a deficit. So how do you deny that deficit as an educator, right? And that's where I come from. And I educate, I teach, I teach social work. And I am now teaching Country Roads, which is five students with intellect with varying intellectual developmental disabilities. And that, and I'm teaching them right now through Zoom, which is like teaching them Zoom. So that's a whole new thing. So I'm seeing so how people vary so much in what their needs are. And I know what how my needs vary even from subject to subject, from English to math, right? So just being open to, you know, being a a more holistic educator and like I said you know that universal design and say you know I'm developing new content how can I develop this in ways where it can meet you know anyone that's in the audience and that way your message is getting a further than what it would if if you'd only put it in one way 
for me, for me, timing is always a, a good example of that. You know, if, I, if I'm giving a timed assessment, a timed quiz or a timed test to really think about like, okay, what, what, what is my reason for, for doing that? <laughs> what, what is the imperative nature that this question be answered in, in 10 seconds, you know? And then maybe taking a look at, okay, well, what, what is the content of this test or quiz? And, and if it's, you know, I don't, I, I, that's, a, that's one that really stands out for me because I think in terms of accommodation and I know my own son is the same way. Uh, he overlaps with many of the things that you've said, uh, Courtney, you know, he can't do anything in a timed environment at all. Um, and so I've w watched that firsthand, how, um, how much he has been limited uh, from a very young age, because he had to answer a multiplication uh, question in this, this amount of time. And he was so focused on that time, that everything else was gone. Um, and so I think to myself with, with the idea of assessments, particularly timed or distractions, like what, you know, um, if, a, if a student asks for that, like, you know, what, what's the harm there or, or why is the timing so essential? And I'm not saying it, there are instances where it is, but very frequently we can look at the content and say, do I really need, is there another way I could be assessing this or another type of question or why am I really timing this and those kinds of things. Yeah, I, that's a wonderful point. Like I said, your son probably has no, pro if you give three minutes to do the problem and you don't tell him, he probably can do it in three minutes. But if you tell him he has three minutes, he's going to be so hyper-focused on that three minutes that he's not going to be able to do the problem. And that's exactly the problem. You get, you get lost by the forest, you know, you get lost by the forest instead of looking at the trees sometimes. And it's overwhelming. Another thing that you can do as an educator, and I think this is just a good thing if you have very, if you have core principles or concepts you're trying to teach are there different ways to test that concept because like i said not everyone's gonna gonna test the same you can't i don't think you can use standardized tests like i said with my spouse that 2d piece of paper works fine for some people to label that that head in the parts of the head right but or the parts of the brain or whatever but for some people seeing that that head there and being able to see it in 3d and manipulate it that works better you're still testing that skill and that part you can give it you can give both tasks to all the students but if it's an important skill that you want to make sure everyone's getting then test it in different ways to everyone and you Courtney, I, I um did a lot of work in my master's degree with multiple intelligences theory Mm -hmm. So I did a lot with about how students learn and the different different ways that they learn our kinesthetic learners, your auditory learners, your visual learners, and really applied that when I was teaching at the collegiate level to try to vary the way that I was teaching each each week to try to hit on those different types of delivery throughout so that you're reaching all of your students and especially with your students who have uh, um, the disabilities and, and more needs, if you can connect with their strengths and, and make something make sense to them. Uh, you know, I had students that I tutored at, at WVU that um, say, I don't get math. I'm always stupid in math. I've never understood math. Had a student who was on a scholarship for, for soccer and he had a learning disability when it came to math. We worked and we figured out what type of learner he was and the kid changed his major to an economics major. He said, math never made sense before now. He said, and I get it now that I can learn it this way, that I don't have to do it this way. And unfortunately, most teachers are going to teach in the method where their learning strengths are. If they're a, an auditory learner, they're gonna stand up there and they're gonna lecture and they're gonna think that's great for every student. And for those visual or kinesthetic learners, they're going to be dying they're going to struggle because they don't get it that way. They need that other stimulus, that other method of, of the input. So really is if you can find those strengths and figure out what they are for those students, that really just makes such a huge difference. I agree with you, Tammy. I do the same thing in my psych class. We read the book, we talk about it in class, and then I have them do an activity and that then accesses the visual and the auditory and the kinesthetic which is really helpful for retention. And I know my students with ADHD really appreciate it because once you do the activity, the light bulb goes on and they're like, oh, now I get it. So I do do that. But I have to say, CJ, I think you guys do a great job of being very flexible and accepting whatever documentation the student has as long as it's valid. 
and you know going above and beyond to make sure they do get the help they need so I haven't seen any rigid responses like you've experienced at WVU Courtney yeah and you know I gotta tell you that I experienced those years ago I mean I've been out of education I've been that was back in early 2000s that I experienced that so I know things have changed in that office I know things are different but I still know that people fall through the gaps so I appreciate the openness that you know your office has that that even your educators have and I just also want to just just tell you something here and to to tell you one Thing that people sometimes bring to the table by the time that you get to them is that they are not empowered they're not good self-advocates and probably they've been told along the way that because of their deficits that they're not going to succeed I remember the exact person who told me and I to this day wish I could see him and just show him because I was told in high school that uh, that I would never succeed, that there's no, that whenever I went, I said, hey, Mr. So-and-so, I'll even say it, Mr. Green, <laughs> hey, I I got accepted to WVU, and he said, I won't give you a, a semester there. Well, here we go. Not only am I, yeah. have a, not only do I have a bachelor's of science with a sociology minor, and I have a master's of social work, I am also an educator at the university, and I'm also a disabilities educator for the state. So he can kiss my butt, right? But it's because I also had people Pat, but after him that believed in me and that said, okay, Courtney, I get it. You're not stupid. In, in fact, you're intelligent in a lot of ways. You just need some extra assistance. You need some extra tweaking. Maybe you need some behavior modif modification that help you like figure things out and, you know, whatever it is to self-regulate you need that extra help and people took those steps and that's how I succeeded and that's how I continue to succeed because I have a director that sees that in me and I also was empowered to be a self-advocate to say hey I need help with this because I'm I'm not understanding what you're saying through my email and through your email because I have a hard time reading and reading things like that will you explain it to me over the phone or whatever it is but I had to be empowered to do that and, and that's some of your roles is to empower people for that. Courtney, I, I just, we're really quick. I, I can't, I can't uh, appre appreciate what you're saying so much because I think you've identified the key and that is that it takes a team, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be able to be one person. Um, those students, sometimes they just need someone to slow it down and break it down a little bit differently, to chunk it for them, um, to give them a new study or learning strategy. And so it's a team. I know, um, you know, when, I, when I've taught in the past, like you have so much going on. Unfortunately, you don't have the time when you're teaching a hundred students students to do that for every student, but there are so many people around you who are part of that team who can pick up some of those extra pieces. So I think it's that whole team coming together to provide each piece of the support and having the awareness to make the referrals and bring the appropriate team to the table for this student or that student. So I just really appreciate that, what you said. Absolutely. And I, would, I want to echo back to that universal design concept that you have and Think outside the box when you're thinking about universal design, okay? And for instance, one of the things that really helped keep my attention span in college and classes is that I had a lot of flexibility in, I would do, I would um, go to one class and I would be given an assignment, maybe it's an English class. Well, my interests are were in gender, sexuality, mental health, right? IDD, all of that. So what I would do is every time I had an opportunity to infuse and make that connection to my interest, I did. And then I succeeded more that way because not only did I see purpose in it, but it was able to hold my attention and all of those things. So anytime that you can have like assignments and you can be more open, I think that's great. And I want to let you guys know, I'll put it in the chat one more time. I told you guys I have a training evaluation form. Please make sure that you fill this out. It's I'm the training uh, director at the center and I make everyone do these and I always say the importance of them. And I tell them all the time, I was like, I beg people to do them on me because I want to grow and I want to make sure that what I'm providing to everyone is adequate and any way I can go above and beyond, I want to know how I can, so. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney. Are there any final questions? I don't want to impose on everyone's time. Any final questions or comments for Courtney? Um, Courtney, just a quick question. Do colleges have access to teachers who are especially trained to teach students with special needs? That was kind of my first question. I know we have great people here that help with students in disabilities, but if you had a student who is really 
like in a special need category that you have no training for? Do colleges, can we refer them to someone? Can we bring on someone or? I mean, it would be great if colleges had it, like it really, it would be wonderful if every department had someone who really was adequate in div disabilities and, and all of that, that would be ideal, but that it's just not, that's not the case. You got those couple educators who they've, they've worked, they've, maybe they've got educated, maybe they, they're sprinkled in here and there, but beyond those disability offices, I think that's where a majority of your resources really lie. And then also looking at like, uh, you know, you have your own disability office, which I'm gonna say you guys should always default to, but they all, you know, CJ, you guys always know that we are also an extended resource for you guys as a community um, provider, you know, we, we, you saw everything we do. We do all, we do all this education, all this stuff. So any way that we can help you guys, we are more than willing to try. I really recommend you guys, and I'm going to put our, our email or our website, get on our website and go to our assistive technology page and start to look at that lending library. It will be helpful. I, my mom had knee surgery and I rented out a shower stool for her because I did she only needed it for a week. And why would you pay a hundred dollars when you need it? So they have things such as that small to communication devices to recreational things. So it's a good resource to know, like even if, um, like I said, you know that maybe a student needs like some additional recorder or something like that, it, you know, see like, let's test this out. Let's see if recording my class helps you and listening it to later. Well, you don't want them to spend the money on the recorder. So rent it from us, test it out if it works then get them to get it and then there you go that's helped them so it can be something really simple like a tool to help someone too and courtney i will say just really quickly to follow up on the the diagnoses and the no documentation um, we have excellent um, relationships with some uh, psychologists in the area who can do psych ed evals we have a few who will even do them uh, at no cost if students don't have insurance or absolutely no other way to pay we also have great relationships with our voc rehab folks and sometimes getting that diagnosis as you said during your presentation it changed your life right um, sometimes for individuals we can make that referral and get them to someone who can give them the diagnosis to get them to documentation and not always but in some cases that can be life-changing as well yeah and, and I'll and I'll tell you you know I think I just had a bad experience with that office I think that we had some bad staff then that were in there in that time and that was years ago and we have a new director of that office and all of that and I work with them very closely uh, they're working on country roads with us they're great but I did have that experience and thankfully I did receive services through vocational rehab and uh, I don't know if anyone knows her. I don't know if she's still around, but Jennifer Gillenwater was a huge influence in helping me get through college and to work through everything. So those sources, even beyond uh, what the university can provide to you, are huge resources that can help students and getting them tied in. I think vocational rehab is key because, uh, you know, you guys, your office, CJ, you're helping them address the academic part but that office will help them transition over to that, that vocational part too and, and all of that. So, and there's a ton of resources that they have out there. There's a lot that we do. There's, there's things like project search. There's a ton of different things out there that that office is tied into. Um, so they're a wonderful resource for you guys as well. Like I said, I gotta give shout out to the woman who helped me become who I am too. So give it to Jennifer, not Mr. Green. <laughs> Uh, just as a um, add to to what Mary Ellen had said, um, I'm trained in literature, writing, creative writing, those kind of things, and I do teach some of what we call our developmental education classes, and the students in those classes, their ability is all over the spectrum. You know, I have students who are so low functioning, they literally are illiterate. And then in that same classroom, I've got students who maybe just had a bad test day and really should have been in English 101. So I find the difficulty for me and probably what a lot of our tutors see as well um, is that I'm trained in my specific area. I am not a trained counselor or therapist, so I always do default to CJ. Like, I mean, there was a semester where I was in her office more than she was. Um, <laughs> because sometimes students just really need that help. And I, I don't know. I just wish there was a way 
for me to be, I don't know, how do you wear all those hats? Because, you know, teachers like Kathy and there's a, there's a Joyce Britt, she's not even with us today. And everyone here, clearly they've logged in because they want to learn about this so that we can serve our students the best way we can. But I'm so, but I'm not trained, you know, I'm, I'm not trained in that. So I guess my, I guess ultimately my question is, is that when I just go to CJ and say, help me? Well, that's one thing that you do, and that's definitely one of your go-to and you should go to. That's your immediate resource. That's your immediate fix, right? But one other thing that you can do is you can note your deficits, right? Just like we note students' deficits, and you're one of your deficits is working with maybe this doing accommodations or something, and then seek out continuing education to help bring you up to that level. You know, I I'm so I, I have a psych, soci, and I'm a, I'm a social worker, right? But I work in the I work in the medical school a lot, doing a lot of curriculums where I'm teaching them. I had to learn a lot more about medicine. I had to learn a lot more about about what they do and all of that, so I could be competent in that area. So I can then teach those students my perspective matched with theirs. So that's part of just being an educator. I think is that sometimes we have to move slightly beyond our own discipline. Um, so we can adequately teach our discipline. You know what I mean? So yeah. I just yeah, absolutely. Strongly encourage, I strongly encourage you to seek out those things. Uh, one thing, you know, I just held a conference. It's the first one. I, I got to give myself a pat on the back for that. I organized the first state conference on disabilities. And we did a ton of sessions about uh, job accommodations, about all of these different things. And so going to things like that, we'll be doing another one in 2022, I think. So uh, seeking out education like that, that will help bring you up because you already are probably there, right? You just need help wrapping your brain around how do I manipulate my, what I'm teaching to meet that person's need. Some other yeah, Usually that's the, the difficulty. Um, most times by talking to other teachers, I can find a way, you mm -hmm. know, with ideas. Like I learned a long time ago, um, for all of my classes, like CJ had mentioned, I adjust my test settings in Blackboard. They only see one question at a time because you've got those students when they open that test and they scroll and they see there's 50 questions, they've shut down out of pure anxiety. So if you can only see one question at a time, mm -hmm. you can all, they can go back and forth and blah, blah, blah. But you know, it just, I think that that alleviates a lot of that anxiety, but then there just are times where I truly, you know, I've got a student who has an accommodation be, uh, for a reader while I teach reading. I don't know how I can accommodate that student when I'm actually assessing their ability to read, but their accommodation allows for a reader. Or one of my close friends, close colleagues is a math <laughs> teacher. Sorry. I was looking at my dog to see if he would respond because he. <laughs> yeah. But even there, even there, Shanna, are you are you when you say you're assessing reading, what what essentially are you assessing? You're assess, uh, assessing comprehension, right? What you're not you're not um, assessing phonetics, right? Um, so even that, I'm, I'm. It's curious to me to think about what well, what is the true outcome? What is the true assessment here? Am I assessing for comprehension? If so, if that student's receiving that information. In an auditory means that does that am I still able to uh, I'm assessing their comprehension whether they're you know they read it or they hear it because there are those individuals who go through life relying on their auditory sense to interpret and make sense of the world right absolutely and I'm going to piggyback on that and play devil's advocate what if the person is has a uh, low or no vision right mm -hmm. are you going to say that you can't teach them reading comprehension no because because there's accommodations for that you know everyone or what if someone what if someone's in an accident while they're in your class and they lose their vision do you just are you like do you what do I I can't teach it no you would make accommodations based on that so just because you can't see their disability don't let that uh that accommodation intimidate you just approach it like you would if they had a physical disability that you're able to see and then you're having to navigate you know, I think the most difficult thing for me is that I know I have students who have severe intellectual disabilities and their IQ. I'm also a social worker and I've worked in the field for 40 years and I know their IQ is probably 65, maybe 70, and they cannot do it. They're just not going to be able to do it no matter what accommodations I make for them. And that's tough because I still have to keep trying, but 
you know, on some level, they just don't have the capacity to get it. And I think that's part of what Shanna is talking about. I mean, if I've got ADHD or a learning disability or a physical disability, I have no problem, but I feel like I'm almost misleading them in, you know, they're in my class and they're trying to pass. And in my estimation, they just aren't going to be able to do it. And that's sad, but that's reality for some people, you know, so I'm not sure how you make the distinction if you're not in the field about, you know, learning disability versus ADHD versus a 65 IQ. And I, I feel frustrated by that. And I don't know that there's an answer to that, but that's, you know, one of my frustrations is that mm -hmm. someone once told me, and it wasn't CJ said, well, you have to give them the opportunity to fail. And I know that, but every time they fail, then that's another, you know, it's a blow whatever. to their system. It's a blow, and it's it's another negative experience on top of whatever else. So I, I feel conflicted about that, and I think that's what Shanna and Mary Ellen are saying to some yeah. degree. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are students that we can definitely adjust and help and accommodate, but then, like Kathy says, there are some that, man honestly like just between us here in the room I just want to look at them or their parents or their guardian or someone and say listen this is not the place for them because I lay awake at night knowing that they're going to flunk that test and they're going to flunk the next one and they're going to flunk the next one and I mean how god that's just like getting beat down it's just awful when I know clearly they've got skills that they could be doing something else in the world so I'll stop you there uh -huh. Hold on a second. I'm going to stop you, all right? And I'm going to okay. say, I've heard a couple themes, and I've heard they can't do it. And I'm going to tell you that uh, sometimes we create this, this glass ceiling above people, right? Uh, and we assume that they can't, just because they can't do it right now, that they're never going to do it. So what I'm going to say is, right now, you may be seeing where someone can't do it. Right? You're, not, you're not inaccurate about that. You're, you're seeing this, right? So what you need to do is to say that they can never do it. You need to take a, take a step back and say, okay, what do, where are they and what do they need to get them here? And how, maybe you can't provide that to them, but you can work with people to get them the, re, you can tap into that community to get them to the resources and you can work them and say, hey, okay, you're not here yet, but let's get a game plan. Let's talk to the, your counselor, your advisor. Let's talk to CJ. Let's talk to these people. So you can get here. You're not here right now, and that's okay, right? I mean, your whole English class exists because people aren't at that English level where they need to be, right? So right. they develop this whole class. So where, what do we need to get here? Maybe we need to get some voc rehab. Maybe we need to get some other counseling. Maybe we need to, um, I don't know where you got, I don't know where exactly your campus is located, but if you're in Morgantown, maybe is there things at Stepping Stone, some, some computer classes that they're doing, or is there things that they're being offered in the community? And that's not just your job to find. But this is exactly, stop you're hitting what, it right on the nose. This is exactly what we're asking you. We yeah. don't have the training and the skills to figure out how to get them from here to there. And I think what Chana and, and Kathy are saying, we don't mean they, we, I know we're saying it, but we don't mean yeah. they can never do it. We mean that we don't know how to get them there because the course only goes so long and the test is next week. And maybe there's not, it is not, to my mind, and this is uneducated, and I need more help here too. In my mind, it's not that they don't have accommodations made for them. It's that there's an ability thing there that it might take them two years to do a semester course. They could get there. So that's what I mean. You know, where do we find those assets? Because we don't know how to train. Yeah, and and I'm not bashing you guys and saying that. I just I point out language to you because language is extreme, and you're going to learn this next week. Language is extremely powerful. And if I would have heard the things that Mr. Green was saying to me and I would have internalized them, maybe I would not be where I'm at right now, right? Oh, so, and so you got to take that shift and say, okay, listen, you're not at this skill level right here in this class, okay? And you're going to fail. And this is money that you're spending and all this stuff. And I don't have that. I need to help. I will help you identify and I will work with them to help you identify what you may need to get to this level based on where you're at. And then let's get you those resources. You know, I know the universe, uh, like WVU has done things to allow like people to like, and we're planning on this with Country Roads. So we're, I'm going to tell you now, like right now, I'm anticipating having these conversations with some WVU staff members, some, some professors, when we get to the point with Country Roads that it, be, it moves beyond our internal faculty. Because right now we're working on different skill levels with them. They haven't yet gotten into 
And our plan is to have them begin to audit classes. So they're not enrolled in the class necessarily, but they're, and they're not getting a grade that's going on their, their permanent record, but they're getting this exposure. And so maybe, maybe you can say, okay, listen, we're at this point where you're getting close to withdrawal. I'm not sure that you're going to be able to pass this. I don't want it on your record because you're not saying, I know that you guys don't believe that they can't get it someday. They're just not right now at the point where they can. So what you can say is, is there a way, and I don't know if your university does this, I feel like a lot of do. Is there a way that we can get you to, to drop the class, but you can still audit it so we can still keep working and maybe you can audit it again next semester and then enroll in it in the spring or in the fall. Just but saying. if we don't have a teacher to help that student, I, I don't know how Chana feels, but I've tried and I can't get them there. So all of that makes sense to me, except there's that missing piece of, where is that specialist that can get them there? Well, and, and maybe Mary Ellen and I, and I, I know Courtney, this is not gonna, you know, um, again, it, it, it's not one person that's going to get them there. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, it's time. It's, it's not the right time in their lives. It's not the right place, um, you know, maybe in the future and maybe they're on the wrong path. Maybe they need to head a different direction. So even with a specialist, and, and I appreciate what Courtney is saying about the individual role and maximizing what you're doing, but I think there's also something that's organizational and looking at the structure of the institution and the ways that the institution has programs and services and is developing support in these classes. Things like the audit um, policy that you just mentioned. Things like embedding support. So for those students who need more time, there is a structured way for them to have that more time. Things that can be built into our organization and our institution to ensure that we're providing the levels and the types of support that are needed. So I think it, it requires both of those, a commitment of the individual instructor, but also a commitment of the institution to look whole holistically and say, this is what we're doing. Yeah. And before, you know, and I, and I agree, there may be times where that person may be on a path that they're just not going to be able to, we really don't think how much we intervene that they're going to be able to do this. So maybe they want to be a doctor, but no matter how much intervention we make, we really just don't think that we don't want to discredit that, right? We don't want to say you're never going to be a doctor because people do that. And while we, it's easy to do that. So instead, one thing I always say to do is to have that conversation with them. If you don't think this is a viable path for them, so you don't think they're going to get accepted into a program, they're just not. You can say, okay, listen, what is it about being a doctor that's important to you? Why do you want to be a doctor? And I'm not saying you have to have this conversation, but somewhere, someone along the line should be having this and then hear it because it may not be about being a doctor. There may be a, you know, me, I never wanted to be labeled a social worker. That's not what I set out to be, right? But I saw, I learned what social workers did. I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what my outcome looked like. And then I found out that there were multiple paths to get to that outcome. And maybe being on one path wasn't for me. So I said, well, this path makes more sense to me. We all do that in a lot of ways, right? You're like, I wanna be this one, or I wanna do this when I grow up. Well, how do you do it? Well, there's multiple paths. So maybe that path isn't for that person. So, but you have to understand like, why are they there anyway? What is it about why they're in the seat that they're in that got them there? Yeah, there and was one conversation. How do you help them? I know one of our faculty had had with a student who, you know, wants to be a nurse, but she can't stand the sight of blood. Yeah. So they had a real hard conversation. She said, listen, do you want to be a nurse? Like, why do you want nursing? Because you have to be able to deal with bodily fluids, especially blood. And she gave some other answers that really ultimately came down to, she just wanted to be in the medical field to help people. So they kind of pointed her in other directions that were more maybe friendly to her aversion to blood. Um, so I guess that would be something that we could defer to. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I wanted to be a psychiatrist, but I'm not going through all those other nasty rotations that I would have right, to. Right. I mean, maybe that's where we as instructors or tutors, Mary Ellen, need to call in our career counselor, um, call in Ida and CJ or say, okay, well, or go talk to another nursing faculty who maybe has held other positions in the health field. So... Oh, Again, I need to keep thinking about what CJ and you are saying is use the whole team. 
Yeah. I don't have to solve every problem myself. I need to use the whole team. But then sometimes the type A personality in me goes, you're just shrugging off your job. I was given really good counsel once as a teacher and I, it's, it's resonated with me still. Um, someone said to me, never cross the line of predicting the future in your interactions with a student, but you can stick to what you're observing right now. Based on the work that I've seen, the progress that you're made, that's been made, um, the, 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 you know, the level of work that's being submitted right now, um, that's what I can say. Um, it is, it's not up to standard or it isn't where it needs to be. But to be very careful then about crossing the line into saying, because of that, you can't do this or you're never going to be successful with. Um, but to just remain focused on the here and now based on the current coursework, the level of understanding that you're demonstrating, um, we, we're going to have to we're going to have to change pace. We're going to have to come up with some items, change direction, and that's always resonated with me as a way to remain avoid crossing over into that. You can't, you'll never ceiling. You know. Yeah, because even if we don't mean it, and that they'll never do it, that sometimes we run the risk if we don't be careful how we say it that that's how they take it. And bottom line is we never know. <laughs> we don't. I don't. You and I. We don't get to handpick this one will and this one won't and this one will. We don't. You know. So, well, I strongly encourage you guys, please like us and fill out the link. I, we have several other trainings uh, scheduled over the next couple of weeks. So I strongly encourage you guys to join us. Hopefully, you know, I can reinforce some of these things and I can help you guys navigate this whole world uh, of working with individuals with disabilities a little better. We thank you so much. I'm so excited for your upcoming uh, presentations, Courtney. This was really wonderful. And I will make sure to send that link out um, to everyone um, so that they can take some time to, to do that for you. Yeah, um, and, I'll, and I will be in a few minutes. I need to make a, call, a phone call uh, to my insurance company about my car. Hopefully it's good news. And then I will send you a copy of this presentation as well as the social work CEU form. So if you do have any social workers and also know that I have had people that they submit that form to other boards and they do accept them as continuing education, I can't guarantee it, but you're more than welcome to have the certificate stating that you attended for two hours if you'd like though. That would be perfect, Shanna. Yes, that would be perfect for you as well. Even yeah, if not, faculty not using the hours, at the least members will the, need that. Yeah. Yeah, faculty will put that with their uh, merit and, and packet. So wonderful. Okay, right. thanks so much, Courtney. We appreciate your time. Right. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.